Today I'm asking the question, why don't we have cryosleep yet? We've seen it a hundred times in movies, from Avatar to Interstellar to the one that weirdly sticks in my mind, passengers. Cryosleep is the idea that you can free someone and then thaw them out months or even years later perfectly alive with all of their memories and body intact as if nothing even happened. It's an exhilarating and terrifying idea. But I think it captures our imagination because cryosleep, if it were possible, would have huge implications for our lives. If you think about it, cryosleep is essentially the promise of immortality. You can freeze yourself at one age and then wake up years in the future where medicine is advanced enough to keep you alive. And as far as your consciousness is concerned, cryosleep is kind of like a form of time travel. You fall asleep and then the next thing you know, you're years or even decades in the future and it's as if you've traveled in time because your body is the same as when you first went to sleep. But cryosleep is also genuinely one of the most practical directions for the future of space travel. As you probably know, distances in space are impossibly vast. Just traveling to Mars, our closest planetary neighbor, can take over six months. And if you wanted to travel further than Mars, we're talking about being on a spaceship for years decades or even lifetimes. But if astronauts could be in cryosleep for those long missions, then they wouldn't need as much oxygen, food and water, which is a huge amount of the hassle with sending people to space, and they would also have the benefit of sleeping through this long journey, which means they potentially wouldn't have the psychological stress of being cooped up in a spaceship for months on months on end. So is cryosleep possible? No. Unfortunately, cryosleep is not possible yet. Not for astronauts, not for billionaires, not for anyone. In those capsules, people who determine to live twice, who prefer the freezer to the grave. The first of the die now, live later group. Freezing patients after they die so that one day they may live again. So to better understand why we haven't been able to achieve cryosleep yet, let's break it down into its two constituent parts, the cryo and the sleep. And let's start with the cryo, because most of the problems are to do with the freezing. So the cryo of cryosleep comes from the Greek word cryos, which means ice or frost. But why would we want to freeze people in the first place? What does it actually do to the objectives of cryosleep? Well, it actually makes a lot of sense scientifically. The goal of freezing people is to lower their metabolism, because the lower somebody's metabolism, the less oxygen they need, the less food they need, and crucially, the slower their cells age, which is all really important for cryosleep. We want people to be suspended in a low resource state where their bodies are preserved and not aging for a long period of time so that when they wake up, they're pretty much the same as when they went to sleep. So the logic goes that if we can cool people down enough, then surely we can lower their metabolism enough to a point where they're essentially not aging and barely using any resources at all. We actually use this concept of cooling people down in medicine today. Here's a picture of it. This is a picture of somebody going through what's called therapeutic hypothermia. Typically, doctors might use this after somebody has gone through cardiac arrest because the concern there is that the brain is not getting enough oxygen. And so by cooling the body down, including the brain, doctors can lower the metabolism of the brain, reducing the oxygen and glucose requirement of it, which potentially can reduce the amount of damage that is done while the brain is starved of oxygen. So easy peasy, right? If you want to preserve a body, just chuck it in the freezer. Well, it's not hard to put a body in the freezer. Uh, I, I assume, at least that's what my, uh, my friend told me. But just freezing a body does not mean that that body will be preserved in a good enough condition where after you thaw it out, it can be used like a normal healthy body again. When you try and freeze a human body, ice crystals form in and between the cells, and these ice crystals can puncture cell membranes and destroy them. So essentially what happens is that if you freeze a body, these ice crystals puncture the cells and turn your organs into slush not very useful. So the first challenge of cryosleep is how do you freeze a human body without ice crystals forming? And look, if turning people into space pop scores isn't tricky enough, there's another type of preservation we're not doing so well at, protecting our digital selves. Because while cryosleep might be a fantasy, 
data breaches, they're very real and they're happening constantly. For example, Bank of America recently announced a data breach and what's shocking is that they didn't tell anyone for months. On average, it takes companies 277 days to report a data breach, which means that personal information like your phone number, email, or even your social security number could be exposed right now and you wouldn't even know. That's why today's sponsor Aura is worth knowing about, especially if you're in the US. Aura is a digital safety service that monitors the dark web for your sensitive information and alerts you if your data is found or if someone tries to use it to open a bank or credit account in your name. It includes up to $5 million in identity theft insurance and combines credit monitoring, fraud alerts, and data breach tracking all into one easy to use app. You can try it completely free for 14 days at aura.com slash pjudo, which is long enough to find out if any of your personal data has already been exposed. Because the companies that leak your data, they'll often only offer free credit monitoring after the damage is done, which is like installing a lock after someone's already broken in. So if you're in the US, head to aura.com com slash pjudo to start your free trial. The link is also in the description. Thank you, Aura, for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to the problem of how to freeze a human body. Well, one solution is to try and reduce the volume of stuff that you're freezing. You see, the problem with trying to freeze a whole adult human is that we're too big. More and larger ice crystals form the slower things freeze. So what happens when you try to freeze a large volume of tissue, like the whole adult human, is that because we freeze from the outside in, while the outside of us might freeze very quickly, the inside of us, like our internal organs and our brain, will freeze relatively slowly. And that slow freezing results in more and larger ice crystals, leading to more cell damage and slush. So by reducing the volume of tissue that we're trying to freeze at any one time, the better chance we have of preserving the integrity of that tissue. But in addition to freezing a smaller volume of tissue, we can also use a process called vitrification. So vitrification is a process where we try and replace the water inside and outside of tissue cells with chemicals that don't form ice crystals. By doing this, we remove as much water from that tissue as possible so that when that tissue is cooled down to freezing temperatures, ice crystals don't form and damage the tissue. Scientists have successfully done this with many different types of tissues. And the way it works is that you replace as much water as possible with these different anti-freezing chemicals, and then you dunk that tissue in liquid nitrogen to freeze the tissue as quickly as possible so that as few ice crystals form as possible, and if any do form, they're extremely small. So we're actually doing that already. If you've ever heard of egg freezing, this is essentially what we're doing. We're vitrifying eggs, dunking them in liquid nitrogen in order to freeze them in a state where as little cell damage is happening as possible. Now, obviously a human egg is just one cell. It's the largest single cell in the human body, but it is also just one big cell. And because it's just one cell, the volume to surface area ratio is such that the freezing can happen very quickly without big ice crystals forming. So this technology is such that we're able to do this with human embryos with a decent amount of success. And fairly recently, scientists have been experimenting with doing this with larger, more complex tissue structures like human organs. As far as I know, we haven't been able to successfully use this process on a human organ yet, but we have been able to successfully transplant a vitrified rat organ from one rat to another. Now, obviously rat organs are a lot smaller than human organs, so their volume to surface area ratio is a lot more favorable for this process. But the hope is that one day we'll be able to scale this process up so that we can do whole human organs, which would completely revolutionize the world of organ transplant, and then eventually do this process for an entire human being. In fact, Tom Scott has a video where he visits a lab where people pay $200,000 to have their entire body vitrified and then stored in liquid nitrogen. And they do this as quickly as possible after death with the hope that one day in the future, technology will be good enough to rewarm them and get them out of that state. But that brings us on to the next challenge of freezing people, which is how do you then thaw them out? How do you then rewarm them? Because it turns out you need to rewarm people very quickly in order to avoid forming ice crystals once again. If you do it too slowly, ice crystals can form in the body and destroy the tissue just the same as freezing it. And so when it comes to rewarming tissues, you're kind of back to the same volume to surface area ratio problem. The larger the volume of the tissue that you're trying to thaw out is, the harder it is to do so evenly to prevent the formation of ice crystals. Additionally, when you're trying to rewarm tissue that's gone through vitrification, you have to go through an additional step of replacing those antifreeze chemicals in the body with water as quickly as possible because those chemicals that don't freeze are actually toxic to tissue if they're left in there. And so if you don't replace that with water quickly, 
those toxic chemicals will actually kill the tissue that they're protecting. Now with a human egg or with a rat organ, which have more favorable surface area to volume ratios, we're able to do this quick enough where we can preserve the tissue without killing it. But in a whole human body, this is a huge problem. How do you replace the vitrification chemicals with water? So to be very clear, the whole world of cryonics and freezing yourself and vitrifying your body is hugely speculative and is probably a massive waste of $200,000. But if that's what you wanna do with your money, that's what you want to do with your money. I'm not here to judge you. But what if we ditched the whole cryo part of this entirely and just focused on the sleep? If you think about it, animals kind of do this all the time in the form of hibernation. Animals will store up resources and then go to sleep for months on end and then wake up months later once conditions are more favorable. When animals hibernate, they enter extremely deep sleep, what scientists call torpor. And in this state, they have a significantly reduced metabolism. Some animals are able to reduce their metabolism by up to 98%. Now typically animals that hibernate are smaller animals, things like squirrels and bats, but larger animals hibernate too. If you think about bears, huge animals, they also hibernate for five to seven months at a time. And research shows that bears are able to reduce their metabolism by 50 to 75% when they're hibernating. So during this hibernation time, they're not eating, they're not drinking, they're not urinating, they're not defecating, and they're able to maintain pretty much all of their muscle mass despite being completely inactive. So it's not so crazy to think that if we can induce a state of hibernation in humans or torpor, then we're able to sort of get the benefits of cryosleep without having to go through the complicated process of freezing people. And if animals are able to do this on their own just by storing up enough fat and going to sleep, then perhaps we can do this with the assistance of technology. You could imagine a chamber that's very carefully temperature controlled and maybe in like an, an IV or some kind of mechanical solution that allows us to feed in hydration and nutrients while we're in this state. That could potentially allow us to stay in this torpor, very deep sleep state for an extended period of time, maybe six months or more, which would make the trip to Mars or further a lot easier. And again, as I said up front at the start of this video, this would also significantly reduce the psychological stress of space travel. Being cooped up in a small space, we all know from lockdown, is not a great feeling. So just being able to sleep through that entire troublesome journey would be hugely beneficial. So NASA is actually looking into this right now. They're funding research into inducing torpor in humans. Scientists typically call this metabolic suppression. And they're looking into things like temperature regulation, sedation protocols, and how to prevent muscle atrophy during rest. So we're not there yet, but if we can get torpor to work for astronauts or just space tourists, then that's a huge step to essentially achieving cryosleep. And the implications of this technology go far beyond just space travel for billionaires. It would also completely revolutionize medicine as well. So so that's why we don't have cryo sleep yet, but perhaps one day in some form we will. What do you think of cryo sleep? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want more videos about interesting questions in science, subscribe for more. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.